Welcome. I'm Mary Davidson and it's our community. Our guest today, very interesting gentleman. His name is Dr. James Liker. He is an associate professor of history here at Johnson County Community College and he has a bio as long as your arm and I'm going to try to tell them who you are because it is so interesting, Jim. He, um, his research focuses on the history of race relations in the American West and the communities and cultures of the Great Plains. In other words, he's a regional historian. And his articles have appeared really widely in Kansas History, in the Western Historical Quarterly, Great Plains Quarterly, and his book, which is absolutely fascinating and you would enjoy, is called Racial Borders, Black Soldiers Along the Rio Grande. Um, and it was published uh, by Texas A&M. Um, he was co-winner of the T.R. Fehrenbach Award for Best Book on Texas History and was ruled one of the eight best books on the Southwest by the Border Regional Library Association. That is a really big honor, Jim. He served as a consultant on the Ford Foundation grant examining the historical intersections between African Americans and Native Americans as well as a teaching American history grant in which he explored the legacies of the Brown decision, um, 1954 as you recall. And he's currently researching the study of the Cheyenne Exodus of 1878 and its impact on the cultural conflict of the Plains. It's not dry, truly it's not. And what Jim writes is I think most interesting. Um, and I have read some of your, your um, material and it's fascinating, you would enjoy it. Um, James Baldwin said that people are trapped in history and history is trapped in them. And I think that's true. I think it is also. Yeah. I want to start out w with the book that you wrote on black soldiers' racial borders along the Rio Grande River. And you make note of the fact that after 1865, at the end of the Civil War, hundreds of African Americans enlisted in the Army to gain social mobility and a regular paycheck. How did, because they had no citizenship, or did it make any difference? How did the army come to accept them? Did they look for them? Did the African American people, men, find the army? And how did that happen? You know, it's really um, tempting to romanticize that part of their story. The, the truth is, um, a lot of men joined the frontier army, white and black, simply because they had few other opportunities. This is a time when the U.S. Army was mostly occupied by um, immigrants, by unemployed industrial workers, and in the case of Buffalo soldiers, former slaves. Some of them were sharecroppers trying to escape debts in the South. It's also a time after the Civil War when black men have somewhat proved themselves in terms of military service. The Civil War was the first time that they were allowed to enlist in a regular army. And after the Civil War, it's the first time that they're allowed to enlist in a regular peacetime army. So there were many in the country who saw military service as the next natural step towards citizenship, of elevating them out of slavery and providing some, some new opportunities. Although it was usually the men, again, with few options who really went into the army at that time. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> you make the point, which I think is sort of interesting, that um, the irony of the whole thing of African Americans serving in the military aided in the subjugation of the Indians and the Hispanics. Would you talk about that just that a little bit? That is the irony of it, and that was the, that, it was that irony that kind of drew me into the topic in the first place. Um, before the Civil War, if you look at the border between Texas and Mexico, it, it was kind of a frontier zone where race didn't have a whole lot of meaning. And so we often hear about runaway slaves who made it to Canada, but what we forget is that before the Civil War, many um, made it to Mexico. Mexico offered sanctuary for runaway slaves because slavery was illegal mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. um, there were cases of black men who found sanctuary with Indian tribes. You had um, white renegades, people who didn't fit into Anglo society who were doing the same thing. So I, I don't want to paint a rosy picture that the border area was this um, rainbow coalition of you know, r yeah. racial brotherhood. But there does seem to be a lot of evidence. But that there was a polyglot of yes, humanity that's right. there. That's right. Yeah. And yeah. they had their problems and they had violence, yeah. but yeah. race didn't seem to be one of those problems. Uh, 
So you have a lot of evidence of blacks getting along very well with Indians and Hispanics, but that starts to change um, when black men are used by the U.S. Army to create a new order yeah. in that region. Yeah. Well, did that, did that subjugation that happened at that period, did it carry on um, in the race relations that have subsequently um, come to I, I think it. I think it does. Um, I, I think what's really happening at that time is that the U.S. Army and the U.S. government are trying to create a border where there wasn't one before, mm -hmm. and that means creating national identity. It we means, have the same problem today. Yeah, well, we're still trying to create <laughs> yeah. that border in, in yeah. a lot of ways. Yeah. It means creating that. It means creating racial identities. Mm -hmm. And just by just the very act of making people think of themselves as racial actors, it sets us up for the problems of the 20th century. And there have been a number of studies showing that in South Texas, West Texas today, it's really not a white versus um, non-white sort of thing. As to use your mm -hmm. word, it really is a polyglot mm -hmm. um, of groups all sort of competing with each other. And I, I think it really begins in that period when. But it also set up a contentious <laughs> relationship among people who were not contentious before. Well, it they were they were contentious me. for other reasons, but right, maybe but not, not race, race or not nationality. Race. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. that's very interesting. Um, what you know? What did the white settlers think of these African American soldiers who were protecting them? Did they? What not, was much. Their? not much. Not much. Um, <laughs> yeah. You got to remember too that after the Civil War, Texas um, was going through Reconstruction. They had been mm -hmm. part of the Confederacy. Yeah. So yes, yeah. your average Anglo in Texas resented the U.S. Army's not overjoyed, presence. Not right. Yeah. So they're, they're angry about that on the one hand. On the other, the army is seen as this um, oppressive force that's bringing in black men of all creatures to, um, to impose this, this kind of national hegemony on us. So both the fact that the army is there and the fact that they're using former slaves to do it it's creating for a lot of hostility. Well, and, and I think there are a couple of words here we can pull out, and one is um, a contentious um, arrangement that's been set up, and, and people who feel that something is being forced upon them. Mm -hmm. So, and that creates a kind of a tension. It does, it yeah. does, a lot of resentment. Yeah, mm -hmm. it does. But, but I have to say that you also indicate that from that, there has been a fallout in the years that came after, for example, with the punitive expedition mm -hmm. in, in World War I. Mm -hmm. So that, those kinds of um, uh, events created a fallout. I, I think what, what happens <coughs> is that by the early 20th century, in those events you're describing, mm -hmm. um, African-American civilians have noticed the military. Um, mm -hmm. Earlier in the frontier period of the 1870s, not so much, but after the release of the Souls of Black Folk and after you see the establishment of groups like the NAACP, African Americans are looking for new opportunities. Mm -hmm. And they're discovering in military service, they think, a route toward equality and full citizenship rights and maybe an end to segregation. So what's Which was not necessarily an idea shared by all of that's the, right. of the uh, that's actors right. That's involved. Right. Yeah. Um, but when you get to the time of the punitive expedition and then especially in World War I, Black soldiers are, mm, they're fighting at a time when the stakes are a lot higher. When fellow African Americans are looking stakes. at them. personal Yeah, the personal yeah. stakes mm -hmm. as well as, well, the stakes of the entire race. Yeah, well, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, the entire nation is watching them during that time. Yeah. What's really tragic about that whole story is that after World War I, in which almost half a million black men served overseas, you have in the aftermath of that race riots in 1919, um, lynching violence go on, goes on the rise again. There were a lot of black leaders who hoped that service in World War I was going to finally provide them equality and real democracy, and that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I think, why in the 1920s there's kind of a backing away among the black leadership that um, maybe integration with whites is not what we want. And so there you get the movements like Marcus Garvey's and Back to Africa movement and the New Negro looking inward rather than outward. We kind of move in cycles, don't we? <coughs> we do indeed. Yeah. What, the Army had a major role in changing um, the Rio Grande from, um, from a frontier to a border, did it not? I think it did. And all of this becomes a part of history that continues on or that we remember or that we don't remember. 
Well, I think you put it best a second ago with cycles. Yeah. We're still creating borders. Yes. Um, I like to tell my students that um, national borders are like the scrimmage line on a TV football game. <laughs> I mean, they're not there in reality. You just sort of have to imagine them. And what the Army was really doing in that time period was to enforce the idea of a border. This is where national jurisdiction stops and another country takes over. Whereas before that, probably most border dwellers could have cared less um, what that line really meant. So the Army was there to give some tooth to the whole idea of national authority. But they didn't actually change everybody's no, mind. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. So and that, we're still yeah, contesting that. Yeah, sure. yeah. You must have found some really interesting primary sources for writing this book. Are there any that come to mind? I had a lot of fun um, looking at the primary records. I use primarily African-American newspapers, lots and lots of military records, regimental returns, post returns. Um, court martial records were especially interesting. Um, that's where I found evidence here and there of blacks and Hispanics intermarrying, uh, blacks and whites intermarrying, sometimes committing crimes together, uh, sometimes running away and deserting the army together. Um, also looked at some Spanish records, um, Spanish language records mm -hmm. on the Mexican side of the border just to see what the, Mexi what the Mexican authorities were thinking about all of Was these changes. Was their thinking lots different? You know, it's not surprisingly all that different from what a lot of white Texans were thinking, that uh -huh. here we have these national armies coming in and um, taking away our local provincial mm -hmm. rights. Those darn borders again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I want to switch briefly here to race relations in our own Sunflower State. Um, do you believe that race has in any way defined Kansas? I don't know that it has to a, to a great extent. Um, I, I think we, we like to suppose that it has. We like to tout this image of the free state, at yeah. least in this part of Kansas, yes. as a place of racial toleration and liberality. and. A lot of my work, I, I seem to conclude the opposite, that I, I think Kansans have a lot of ambivalence when it comes to race, although we like to trot out that free state image um, at convenient moments. It may be with a small F instead of a capital Maybe so. <laughs> Maybe so. <laughs> well, uh, um, in the Wyandotte Constitution, you make the point that there was overt racism. Yes. Yeah, it was one thing to be anti-slavery, but that doesn't mean that you were... Um, pro-racial equality. Yeah. In the Wyandotte Constitution, um, the Free State Movement actually proposed in that bill, which would have excluded slavery, would have also excluded free blacks. And that was a real possibility. States like Oregon um, had laws preventing the admission of free African Americans. And a lot of the folks who settled in Kansas came from the same place that the founders of Oregon did, from Missouri. So we're, we're always used to talking about that free state narrative as um, good abolitionists versus bad slave owners. Mm -hmm. And in mm -hmm. fact, what really happened was a compromise between those two positions. Don't you think often history is rather a blur? Yeah, the, 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 yeah. It's very difficult mm -hmm. to, borders, back to the borders mm -hmm. again, it's very difficult to set um, finite lines yeah. in history. I it's think. like an impressionist painting. The farther back you stand from it, it looks clear and vivid, but when you start really looking at the details, it's, as you say, very blurry, and it, mm -hmm. it's hard to make precise generalizations. Along that line, I, I know that in the 20s, the Ku Klux Klan was extremely active in Kansas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the southeast part of the state yes, especially. Yes. And that's a part of the state that had a stronger Confederate presence, and strangely enough, it was also a part of the state where you had an active labor union presence. Many of the same yeah. strikers, the miners, and the, the yeah, lead and the zinc Pittsburgh mines. Around the Pittsburgh area. Yeah, around uh -huh. Pittsburgh, uh -huh. Galena, and uh -huh. so forth. Uh -huh. uh, the same people who were standing up against big business and corporations in the early 20th century by the 20s were participating in KKK rallies. So you really have to wonder what's going on here. Is it about race or is it about something else? Have you decided what's it about? I think Kansans, for the most part, have not changed all that much, but the labels that we use to describe them keep changing. Um, Becoming more palatable, do you think? May, maybe so. Um, I think someone back in the 1910s and 20s might have seen immigrants, blacks, Catholics, and big business all as part of the same evil entity. <laughs> so that might explain how someone could be a striker in one decade and a Klan member in the next. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, you know, we 
I guess we are people of many masks and faces. Mm -hmm. so yeah, we are. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when we talk about Kansas, too, I think you call them the newer topics, such as the effort by racial groups to build their own communities and control their own institutions and value systems, which may have come <laughs> out of this um, um, maybe not being able to make clear lines about who we are, where we are, and what we're doing. And Nicodemus is mm -hmm. a, a, an interesting s city because it was founded, populated, governed by mm -hmm. African Americans. Yeah. What's, what's really interesting here is that um, segregation is imposed on African Americans, but they really make it their own and they do something positive with it. That is, that provides an opportunity for having your own black-owned businesses, black churches, black schools, and that's what made communities like Nicodemus possible. And also pride in oneself. Yes, and pride in one's community. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that kind of um, behavior has, for them and for others who, who observed redefined race, does it have anything to do with redefining race or was it just mm -hmm. because it, it is because it was? <laughs> I think we're always redefining race to some extent. I, I think historians are redefining the way they look at the past in that we, we tend to treat, um, for example, black communities as uh, people who were victims. Uh -huh. And that's kind of what our narrative has required of us so far. But I think the newer histories now, the better histories are saying, look, even in the middle of all of that, um, people found ways to cope, they found ways to survive and be happy. So, you know, it's, it's out of those communities that you have the opposition to segregation that leads to things like the Brown decision. Well, it's always, you know, broad general statements kind of get us in trouble yes. sometimes. <laughs> so we have to kind of Absolutely. drill down, as they mm -hmm. say. Uh, would you comment on this, this remark, that Kansas has maintained a position or a pattern of racial liberality on one hand and a system of segregation on the other? I would say that at a state level, we have managed to keep our hands relatively clean when it comes to racial liberality. The state itself, the state government, never really imposed a system of segregation, but it allowed communities to do so at the local level. Um, for example, cities that were above a certain population were allowed to segregate public schools, um, at least up through eighth grade. So on the one hand, it allows Kansans to speak of themselves as a place of racial openness and toleration. But then on the other hand, it also makes it possible to live in Kansas and have um, segregated theaters, seg segregated parks and schools. So, Well, and so yeah. because if we speak about John Brown, mm -hmm. abolition um, in Kansas, I mean, that, that pops out. But underneath that, there are other... Um, uh, things kind of stories turning that, around yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and um, yes Brown versus the Board of Edu uh, Education in Topeka did spark uh, the modern black civil rights movement one some could some could argue mm -hmm. on the other hand it's like Harry Truman always said I'd like to have a one-armed um, uh, economist because they always say on the one <laughs> hand and then on the other hand and so but, but that's really what we have in Kansas is on the one hand and then on the other hand. And, and Langston Hughes described Kansas as Southern-like. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I think, I mean, here we have all these conflicts of, of thought and uh, the South Park School case mm -hmm. over in Kansas City, Kansas, you know, the Esther Brown and all that right. kind of business. Mm -hmm. um, they were segregated and as you say, if they were of a certain size, they could segregate their mm -hmm. students. What seems to be happening lately when I follow the free state narrative is that um, politicians especially seem very eager to pull the story of stopping the expansion of slavery into the 20th century and now are including those stories like you're mentioning, um, the civil rights struggle as an ongoing part of that freedom narrative. Yeah. And you know, history lives in the service of um, civil life, so I, I think that's completely natural. Well, and the other thing I do believe also is that the writers of history sometimes bend the tree a little bit. <laughs> I mean, as, as it becomes farther from today, farther away from today, you know, the, the, the story changes somewhat, too. Well, there's a big debate as to whether history is a science or is it an art. Uh, uh, I don't know that it's really 
either, but it, it certainly has a subjective element. It does. And it, it's really not well, about well, what happened. It's about what historians say happened. And well, historians but you as a writer are somewhat mm -hmm. subjective sure. as well. Mm -hmm. So, And that's okay. That's why you read more than one book that's right. about mm -hmm. Kansas history. So, mm -hmm. Do you think it's, it's possible, mm -hmm. though, to address these racial issues holistically? I think it is. Um, I, I, we're, we're getting better at it. What, one of the things that I think we inherited from the civil rights movement is a tendency to write history through the experiences, through the lenses of specific groups. So uh, Away from those broad general away statements. Away from those broad general yeah, statements, yeah. which was not a bad thing. Yeah. Um, because we needed to know more black history, more Chicano history, and so forth. But mm -hmm. Every action has a, a consequence. The, the An equal and opposite reaction. Right, exactly. <laughs> the, uh, the opposite yeah. reaction to that, which, yeah. what I think is a downside, is that it balkanizes um, the study of the past and it's hindered us from really looking at what's really going on here. What do all of those groups' stories have in common? Um, and I, I think Expl we are starting some, to look at that. Some people who may be listening to you and mm -hmm. watching may not understand that term, balkanized. Balkanization. Uh -huh. Um, it refers to the choppy mountains of Eastern Europe, the Balkan mountains, mm -hmm. where um, ethnic groups have been struggling for national identity for centuries, some would say millennia. And when I apply that term to the study of history, most academics don't talk about history in a general way anymore. They, they talk about the experiences, the past of very particular kinds of groups. And I think what that's really done is it's improved our understanding of the past and given us more depth, more complexity, but somebody's got to start the project of weaving those stories back into a Together. linear narrative again. Together, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, why is it that German immigrants, Italian immigrants, other European immigrants are classed as ethnic groups, but African Americans, Hispanics are classed as minorities? Mm. What? Well, I, I think... It causes that kind of yeah, um, mm -hmm. semantic um, yeah. aber aberration, <laughs> some would say. I, I would think race and ethnicity are very related. Mm -hmm. um, I think ethnicity is often treated in American culture as a subgrouping of race. When America was formed, I think the Founding Fathers probably didn't envision a country that would include Germans and Irish and, yeah. and French. They, they probably saw a future that was dominated by Anglos. But over time, what's happened is that that whole concept of whiteness has been such a huge and welcoming umbrella that it's accommodated all of these different groups from Europe. Because they were white. Because not, they were white. Not they because could claim of where whiteness. they came from. That's Although right. even that wasn't always guaranteed. Uh, there was a time in Mississippi for a while in the late 1800s when Italians were not considered white. Really? Yes. So the consequence of that, going back to that that equal and opposite reaction, is that by being white, you also set yourself up as being not like blacks, not like Indians. You're able to pass. As they right, say. right. Yeah. And so I think in a lot of ways our racial problems have been exacerbated by the fact that whites, however you define that term, have been somewhat welcomed mm -hmm. here under that banner. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we've talked about free state, but we really need to talk about free soil and free men and the growth of the Republican Party mm -hmm. in Kansas. Can yeah, you that do that for us? Um, the Republican Party um, was actually the first party of civil rights in America. And it captured the loyalty, the attention of African Americans even well into the 20th century. What, what seems to happen in the works that I've read in the late 19th century when the Republicans in Kansas are on the um, defensive from populism is that Republicans go out of their way to remind Kansas voters that we were the original party of freedom. Mm -hmm. We were the original party of the little guy, namely the slave. And so, in a lot of ways, that free state narrative is a creation of um, Republicans' history in Kansas. It's a way of lending legitimacy to the party um, to say that, you know, the freedom story here is really because of us. But isn't that what we're talking about here? We're talking about history bending slightly as it moves yes. away from the, the actual free state constitution yes. and, the, and the establishment of the free state. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of migrating to the Republican Party who says we are? Well, I think all, or frankly, any party, frankly I, I think all history is politics. When, um, <laughs> I think a lot of historical narratives are shaped by present needs. I, I, might, I might part from you on one point there. Okay. I don't know that um, getting farther away from a, an event in the past makes our understanding of it more skewed. It might make it more accurate. One would hope. Perhaps. You need a certain detachment from an event before you can really sit back and think at 
through and decide what did it really mean. But I think that that depends in great measure on the objectivity that the historian who writes about it is able to. We can hope. We can hope. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're just, we're <laughs> always hopeful here. We can hope. <laughs> Um, what I think is sort of interesting that is in ca that male suffrage came in 1870, and in 1867, um, black suffrage w was rejected. Yeah. And male suffrage didn't come till 1870. Right. Mm -hmm. So you know, all well, that's kind of. Had we been the free state we think we are, that um, Kansas would have been ahead of the United States. They would have been that ahead. Sense. That's mm -hmm. exactly right. Um, can you spend a couple of seconds discussing racial discrimination as opposed to racial segregation in the 1880s? I found that that mm -hmm. whole part of your uh, writing kind of interesting. I racial segregation, I think, accompanies the increase of African Americans' numbers, um, especially after the Exoduster movement in the late 1870s. And I think it shows that white Kansans had reached the limits of their toleration. Um, it you see a number of laws going through the state legislature in the 1880s that, as we talked about earlier, make it possible for local school districts to practice segregation. But even on an informal level, um, blacks and other groups ex were experiencing discrimination on a, on a daily basis, informal exclusion from mm -hmm. restaurants, from mm -hmm. public areas. Even in Kansas. Even in Kansas. Yeah. So, well, in some ways, especially in, yeah. in Kansas. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Well, I, I think, um, <laughs> in some ways, things just don't change much. There's a, One can there's a historian who argues that since the civil rights movement, everything has changed and nothing has changed. <laughs> now, make sense of that if you can, but I think ultimately humans are paradoxical creatures that are hard to figure out. And I, I, I think there's truth in both of those things. Well, and I think often, you know, you'll talk to somebody and they'll say something and you think, where did that come from? And you say, well, why do you think that? And the answer will be, well, because it's true, or just mm -hmm. because, or, I mean, they don't have always a platform for their mm -hmm. thinking. And I, I think that's... Where do we get those ideas from? I don't know. They have an origin someplace in history, and that's what we're trying to figure out, is yeah. you know, where do we get those foundational values that guide us through our behavior and misbehaviors? <laughs> How do you see the situation today? Taking in, uh, into consideration uh, the progression of the history of the state of Kansas in, in these areas that we're discussing. How do you see the situation today? I think we have a lot of challenges ahead. Um, to me, the, the more interesting questions in the future are going to be resolved probably in the southwestern part of Kansas where we have um, so much immigration now, not only in places like Garden City and Liberal, but also even to some extent here in Johnson County, we're becoming Feeling a more complicated more people. specific. What do you think? Well, normally we've talked about race in Kansas through a uh, dichotomy of blacks and whites, but today we're becoming such a much more multicultural state. Um, lots and lots of new groups are coming here. Um, in the southwest part of the state today, of course, you've got just an increase of immigration that's been brought on there by the meatpacking industry. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think Kansans um, are facing a challenge to live up to that free state image that's going to continue for a long, long time yet. And Are you optimistic? Yeah, you have to be optimistic. I have yeah. no choice but to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what are you writing now? I just finished the Northern Cheyenne Exodus book, which should be coming out in the fall of 2011, um, co-authored with Raymond Powers. And um, after that, I'm actually going to take a break for a little really? while. Really? <laughs> what are you going to do with yourself if you don't write? <laughs> that's what you do. Well, I uh, might go fishing, which oh. I haven't done in years. <laughs> Well, you might catch some interesting information we along with hope. those fish. You never know. But I think, um, um, you know, we were talking um, earlier about regional history um, regaining some status. Um, mm -hmm. Comment on that. Because, you know, you don't find a whole mm -hmm. lot of regional historians like mm -hmm. yourself. You really don't. Uh, regional history has made quite a comeback in the last 20 to 30 years, especially Western history. And I, I think more academics are realizing that you can't really understand the past unless you look at place. And I've been a regionalist, I think, since I was born. My interest in history has always been connected to a particular kind of region. And when I meet people around the world today, my, my first thought is, where are you from? Because if I know that, I know quite a bit about you. I think that's interesting. Um, you haven't always lived around here, so your regional interest has changed. Um, I've had, yeah, my, my regional interests have uh, shifted around quite a bit. I always come back to the American West. So. It's fun. 
But I would have to say, um, Dr. James Liker, Associate Professor of History here at Johnson County Community College, I truly appreciate it. And to you, I would say to you, look at all the interesting people that teach and impart their wonderful knowledge in our county and at our community college. I, it never ceases to uh, amaze me and to make me very proud to be a Johnson Countyan. You're good for my ego. Right? <laughs> John Greenleaf Whittier probably said it best, and he said, the great eventful present hides the past, but through the din of its loud life, hints and echoes from the life behind steal in. And that's what you do. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mike. Thank you for being with us. It's our community, and I'm so glad you were with us. See you soon again.